I'm Dr. Hackey Reitman. Welcome to another episode of Exploring Different Brains. And today I'm very excited to have with us all the way from Boston University School of Medicine, my alma mater, the wonderful Dr. Marsha Ratner, the neurotoxicologist, and so much more. Welcome, Marsha. Hi, Hackey. How are you? I'm glad to be back with you again. Well, thank you so much for coming. Why don't you do a proper introduction of yourself? Because you've got so much going on, it's hard for me, the way my brain is wired, to get it all out. I'm, I'm Dr. Marsha Ratner. Um, I'm at Boston University School of Medicine, where I do research in, looking at the effects of neurotoxicants, uh, chemicals found in the environment and the workplace on the brain. And I'm interested in how these affect our risk for neurodegenerative diseases, as well as how these make us sick all by themselves when exposures are very high and people get sick from the exposure itself. And uh, you're going to talk about the other CTE. What do you mean? Because CTE is getting so much publicity now with football and boxing and sports. And you're going to talk about the other CTE. Enlighten us on that. Right. So um, I, I think that's exactly it, Hacky. So everybody's hearing about CTE now in the news with the football players and, of course, the Hernandez story, you know, right here, a Patriot player. Um, and so people have come to be aware of chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which occurs when someone gets hit repeatedly in, in, in the head as a football player would do. Um, and... Um, but there's another acronym for CTE, which is chronic toxic encephalopathy. And we can think of toxins, chemicals, almost like little, little football players <laughs> that come along and beat up our brains. And um, I'm very interested in, in how those hits to the head, those chemical hits to the head, influence our risk for injury, direct injury to the brain, and how those interact with our risk for age-related neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's. Fascinating, and you know, Alzheimer's, we really haven't made much progress on that all these years, have we? No, in fact, I was recently interviewed about the, 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 you know, the prospects of some of the drugs that are in the pipeline for treating Alzheimer's that are going in to sort of clean up the um, uh, plaques that bioaccumulate in Alzheimer's and, you know, Biogen and other companies, Roche, they all have something in the pipeline right now, um, which we're optimistic that this is really opening the gate to starting to make some progress. But we still don't have a cure. You know, we have some ideas about what's involved, but we don't have a cure. Um, but what we're learning is that other factors can cause similar pathology. So with CTE, the chronic traumatic type, we see a bioaccumulation of a protein called tau, which we also see uh, with Alzheimer's disease. And so we're starting to understand that injuries to the brain lead to bioaccumulation of these misfolded aggregated proteins that play a role in disrupting neurological function, and ultimately in neurodegenerative diseases. Well, I'm going to have to introduce you sometime to my good friend Ken Dykewald of AgeWave. And uh, he's of the opinion that we've kind of scientifically been barking up the wrong tree all these years, and he's trying to stimulate real out-of-the-box kind of thinking. Um, in the sense that we're always starting in reverse with Alzheimer's and dementia, with the tau proteins and the plaques and the deposits, instead of perhaps at the front end. This isn't Ken Dykeball talking, this is just me, but I really enjoy it when people are trying to look at something entirely differently. And I think one of the problems we have is the way the grant system is set up is that you have to show pre-existing work in the field. And so right. it puts 
when someone as bright as you are, when you come up with a whole new way of looking at it, it uh, probably throws you a curveball. Well, um, fortunately, I'm working on a project now where we're looking at neural network activity um, in the brains of an animal model of Alzheimer's, which we think um, precedes the progression and contributes to the progression of the, of the uh, uh, disease. So um, I, I tend to uh, agree with what you're saying. I think that when you look at, because I'm a toxicologist, and if I look at what neurotoxicants do to the nervous system, I see aggregation of proteins there too. And hexane, acrylamide, we talked about in my last interview, these cause aggregation of neurofilaments within the axons of nerves. And so we know that disrupting axonal transport, disrupting cellular energy uh, functions, mitochondrial function, ultimately leads to uh, a, a, a inhibition of transport of, of proteins and things throughout the cell. And if these things start to misfold because of, of uh, uh, aggregates that have bound with them, like a covalently bound uh, chemical, they start to misfold and now they start to aggregate. So this is, as you say, a biological marker of effect, downstream effect, but it's not causal in toxicants. We know that it's the toxicant that's causing it. And the aggregated protein is merely the readout that we see. So I'm uh, not far from your camp. I, I have to say that I think that cleaning up the aggregated proteins is kind of like mopping up a floor and leaving the sink overflowing without turning the water off. That was very, very well said, very well said. Talk to us about the difference between the neurotoxicants effect on children versus adults. Right. So when, you know, we talked last time about what's going on in Flint, and I told you that we don't know yet, right? So when children are developing, and this is um, a big difference between children and adults, when children are developing, they're acquiring language skills, they're acquiring math skills. And if their nervous system is not functioning properly, then they're going to have problems acquiring those skills. And that over time is a you know we all know math is a cumulative thing you, if you didn't learn basic uh, uh addition you're going to struggle when you get into algebra and never even make it to calculus right so it's really crucial that during this developmental time that when students are acquiring these skills language and mathematics skills that they're not having problems because these problems are insidious and gradually over time after several years by the time a student enters, say, junior high or middle school, students who were exposed to chemicals when they were younger, maybe as an infant, by the time they get into middle school, we really start to see problems with math and maybe English. And these problems can interfere with their career prospects and, and they can get put back a grade. The ramifications are very, very big in, in, in children exposed to chemicals because they have long-term consequences on, on, on the population at large and on the individual. And then when you take what you just said and you look at what happened in Flint, Michigan, and all those kids drinking that water, talk to us about that. Yeah, so we, we mentioned that, and I, as I said last time, we don't know yet. So there is funding to monitor these kids and some of their parents are already starting to report problems. So I know I monitor the news on this, and I know that there are some pending lawsuits with parents who are already noticing behavioral and academic problems in some of their children. But we don't have the results of a study yet. So this is sort of anecdotal observations of parents, but we don't have the results of a formal study yet looking at the progress of the exposed children versus children who lived in nearby towns, similar socio-demographic uh, uh, cohort that wasn't exposed. That's the kind of information that we're really going to need to understand the full impact of what happened in Flint. What should a person do? What should a person do if they feel their child has been exposed to neurotoxicants? Yeah, so, you know, the first thing you, you need to do is, you know, uh, determine if you have a suspicion, but if you 
the first thing you should do is confirm that, right? So you can take the child to a local hospital or to their pediatrician and get their blood levels measured for metals. For example, lead, it can be measured in the blood. Um, first thing you should do is document that exposure. Very important to document the exposure because that information is going to become relevant later on, right? Then immediately remove the child from the source of exposure so that it, it, you have cessation of exposure. You have to stop the ongoing exposure. And uh, provided that the child is not that sick, then uh, uh, they, they, their blood levels should be monitored until they return toward baseline. If they're, if they're elevated very high, then chelation may even be necessary to help remove the metals from the body. This is where we take a compound that has a functional loop like a sulfur, which binds to the metal and helps it to be excreted uh, uh, out of the body and eliminated. So um, those are the types of courses of action that you can take. And of course, if the child has been exposed and you know that, then you're going to want to very carefully monitor their academic pro progress. And if necessary, get them tutoring or whatever to help them keep up. And get early intervention is really crucial because academic problems that a child is experiencing that are unrecognized can quickly manifest into behavioral problems. It's not uncommon for children struggling in school to also exhibit behavioral problems. And if you don't know that the cause of the behavior is related to the fact that they're doing poorly in school, you don't put two and two together. You know, that can, can be a problem too. So Parents have to be aware of what their children are, 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 are doing, where they're playing, what's, what's in their toys, and, and monitoring, monitoring for these things. And then be aware of the symptoms. You know, lead, lead exposure in children is often also associated with colic, right? So if, you're, if your child is showing gastrointestinal problems that seem to be chronic, and you have a suspicion that can be a clue that something's wrong. Does the average doctor know what lab batteries to get? I think with, with respect to heavy metals, the general uh, screen for heavy metals is pretty common. Um, but if you suspect that there's an unusual compound, like a pesticide, like an organophosphate, or something like this, or a carbamate that they might have gotten into, uh, the tests for that are a little more specialized, um, and not as many doctors are familiar with those. And not as many doctors are familiar with the effects of chemicals uh, in children. Uh, other, other than that. And, and we're starting to see that developmental exposure in children to organophosphates can have consequences um, at levels that we might not be concerned with again in adults. So the developing brain is a very sensitive uh, 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 time and uh, uh, catching exposures early, removing children from the sources of exposures early, and, and doing what we can to facilitate their acquisition of their math and, and language skills by tutoring them or whatever they need to keep them up with their classmates so they don't get left behind and, and, and develop behavioral issues and other problems as a secondary consequence of struggling with their academic pursuits. Of course, that's not to say that the chemicals can't cause behavioral problems in and of themselves. They can do that as well. So we should be aware of that as well. Now, are there specialists in this area? Yeah, there are developmental uh, uh, specialists who specialize in, in developmental neurotoxicology. Um, and uh, um, I, think I, I, I know that there are some, uh, a, a woman at UMass, um, whose name escapes me right now, but who's a developmental neurotoxicologist. There are definitely people who specialize in developmental neurotoxicology. Um, uh, and so you can, you can find someone, uh, most clinically trained neuropsychologists have a pretty good understanding, at least with respect to lead exposure in children. Right. Well, it sounds like it's a lot more than lead, that's for sure. Oh, yeah, the environment is, is, is filled with potential uh, things. And, and so, you know, the, the most important thing for a child uh, during development is that, as a parent, um, that you're observing how they're doing in school and whenever possible take corrective actions you know it's almost like sailing a ship <laughs> you know you got to change tack once in a while to 
to get them through the system. And the system is designed for a student who might not be struggling. Um, and, uh, uh, and if a child is not identified as having a, a, a developmental learning disability, but develops a learning disability because of a chemical exposure, they would be in a mainstream class rather than maybe in a class where there was additional support and they would fall behind much more quickly because there would be nothing, there's no safety net for them because no one even knows that they're struggling. Um, I would assume there's a higher incidence of neurotoxicants getting into our children in the poverty areas. Would that be a correct uh, assessment? Yeah, low income housing, um, living in, in densely populated areas, you know, uh, where you have a lot of pollution, fine particulate matter, um, uh, older buildings, which may not have had adequate lead abatement or lead is simply covered over, you know, um, it may not be completely removed, um, uh, it adds, adds to the problem. Living near a, a Superfund site, um, there's certainly a lot of uh, issues that come with socioeconomic problems as far as exposure to these chemicals in, in, a, in a more of a home rather than an occupational setting that people uh, encounter. Now, other than remedial tutoring and other than discontinuing the neurotoxicant, what other tools does the family have to not, combat this? Not much, not much, unfortunately. I mean, of course, Legislative action is very important. You know, I, I lobby. I go down to uh, D.C. I'm going to D.C. with the Parkinson's uh, 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 researchers, uh, with Michael J. Fox again next month. And we talk to Congress about our needs uh, to study neurodegenerative diseases. And, and, of course, we're all concerned about the role of environmental exposures to chemicals in children and in, in, in adults. You know, one of the longstanding hypotheses with respect to neurodegenerative diseases is the two-hit model, where someone is exposed to chemicals when they're young, and then as they age, that prior chemical exposure interacts with aging to resurface uh, with a greater risk for neurodegenerative disease later in life. So there's chemical exposures that may occur when we're an adult that could unmask a, a, a latent neurodegenerative disease. But there's also the idea that these exposures can occur many, many years before and not manifest until years later when they interact with aging and the uh, and genetics to, to lead to an increased risk for neurodegenerative diseases. So we're very concerned with this. And, and I lobby Congress and you know, there's bills out there trying to eliminate paraquat and other neurotoxicants that have been implicated as risk factors for causing mitochondrial dysfunction implicated in neurodegenerative diseases. Well, you know, when I think of my dad who passed away with Alzheimer's and Parkinsonism, and uh, thinking about our old family gas station in Jersey City, where he was the mechanic and my mother used to pump gas, and we all kind of hung out there, um, you know, you wonder how much of it is, because it's all going to be end up being multifactorial. Right. And, I'm sure there's a genetic component and an environmental component and the significant neurotoxic and certainly I think underestimated and so forth, which disturbs me all the more that there's been so much emphasis on going at it backwards through the end result, you know? It's kind of almost like uh, we all know what kind of food is good for us and what kind of food is bad for us, and you don't have to wait till after the heart attack to eat what's good. Right, right. And in neurodegenerative disease, we, we don't do that. And the reason is that, you know, when you think about the heart, it's a pump, right? And it's pretty obvious what it does, right? It's got an intake chamber. It's got an exhaust chamber. It's, it's pretty obvious. But with the brain, it's very complicated. And we don't fully understand the mechanics of the brain, right? That the brain is it has an, a, an energy system, the mitochondria, right? It has a, 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 a transportation system, which are the neurofilaments uh, that transport things up and down the axons, right? It has a, a gatekeepers that let things in and out of the cell, regulating ion flux in and out of the cell. 
has a system to bring in big things like like an elevator system to bring in big molecules to endocytosis and get those out by exocytosis. We know a little bit about the mechanics, but we don't fully understand how these interact on a neural network level, where what's going on in the brainstem, which is influencing arousal, translates into what's going on further out in the brain, say in the hippocampus, where the basal level of arousal may influence the activity in the hippocampus that facilitates the transfer of information from one brain region to another, and how all of this interacts and communicates between regions to, to not only function normally, but then what happens when this system starts to malfunction. The malfunction may be in the brainstem, but the readout may be problems with learning and memory because the energy and the level of arousal necessary to transfer information from the hippocampus to long-term storage in the neocortex is dysfunctional. And that, in turn, may lead to other problems as far as what those cells are doing, how they handle uh, debris that are building up in the cells. You know, we know when we sleep that a lot of the debris in the brain gets cleaned. So if sleeping is disrupted, if the circuitry that's going on in sleep and arousal is disrupted, the brain may not cleanse itself properly. And what are you going to have but bioaccumulation of toxicants in the brain as a downstream ultimate event that's really related to an, a, an overall dysfunction of, of energy metabolism and arousal and, and, and transmission of, 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 of activity within the brain. Dr. Marsha Ratner, where can our audience learn more about you? Yeah, so I'm, uh, like I said, I'm with Boston University Department of Pharmacology here. And then I have my own consulting firm called Neurotoxicants.com, where you can learn a lot about the interactions between chemicals and uh, the brain and, and their role in Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Huntington's, uh, and, and Lou Gehrig's disease, which I'm interested in. And um, you can also look me up at the Boston University Department of Pharmacology website. I'm the project manager of the entire department um, and a researcher and an educator here. And um, I'm, I think I've said before, on, on Thursday nights, I give a pro bono consult to anyone who wants to give me a ring and pick my brain. I'm happy to, to do that. Is there anything we have not covered that you would like to cover today? Well, people have the, the uh, blog I wrote on the internet and they can find that there and read more about that. Um, and uh, no, I'm actually kind of, this was kind of fun because we sort of went off into my other hat, which is what I do for research and touched on some of the other things I'm fascinated by. Um, so I think this, we touched on a lot um, and uh, hopefully the viewers will enjoy uh, what, what we've talked about and, and we'll, 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 we'll uh, take uh, that little ripple from <laughs> what we've started here and, and, and talk to each other on the internet and on forums and, and, and really put forth novel ideas, talk to their congressmen, talk to uh, their children or who may be interested in science. Whatever we can do to, to contribute to the process as individuals uh, is a powerful force because the power of us all combined is, is huge. Dr. Marsha Ratner, Boston University School of Medicine and Neurotoxicants.com. Thank you so much for being with us. We hope you'll come back again real soon. You're welcome, Hacky. Nice to be with you. Exploring Different Brains is a production of Different Brains, Inc. For more information, visit us at differentbrains.org.